What you've heard so far, I think, is very much the important story, that there is a remarkable diversity of resources that are available here. In my brief presentation, I will not go through the details of our report. Over the last few months, a team from my laboratory spent time analyzing the data provided by SCSB, by the Palm Oil Association, by a number of the renewable energy suppliers to look at what mix of energy appears not only to be available, but also is economic today and in the future to meet the energy demands for SABA. We have had quite a bit of experience doing this sort of work in the past. In fact, my laboratory has been working for some years in Indonesia. We're currently working in Sumatra. We've been working in East Africa, in Kenya and Tanzania. We're working on biofuels in Brazil, as well as in the United States. So we've worked on a number of systems like this. And again, I will mainly highlight the opportunities. The conclusion, however, is where I want to begin. And I believe there are copies of the report available in the back for those who want to take a look at, at the details. What we found is that the opportunity to diversify the energy mix here, meaning not to think about this as a case of, can we meet the entire future demand with solar, or with coal, or with oil, or with biomass, but in fact, to think of all of these as part of a solution is the most important piece of that story. The conclusion from that is that the most important resource that's available here isn't just the energy sources that we're talking about, but it's the need to coordinate between the private sector, the public sector, and civil society to plan this process out. In fact, we find that the availability of biomass, somewhat larger than has been estimated, the ability, the ability of the grid to provide the opportunity for small-scale biomass systems, as Adrian just mentioned, introducing solar into the system, introducing geothermal and hydro, that that grid development provides an opportunity here for Saba to meet these future energy demands and not only do it by replacing fossil fuels, but in fact to generate more jobs than a single technology approach. I'll highlight only a few pieces of this as we go. One important piece of background is that over the last decade, international investment in all of these low carbon, clean energy areas has been rising dramatically. I just show the curves for the global investment in billions of dollars in solar, in biomass, in wind, in biofuels, and in the one we haven't mentioned enough yet, and that is energy efficiency, meaning efficiency at the generation plants, efficiency at the end use in buildings like this, and in particular, in efficiency of the boilers. And I will come back in a minute to that process to improve the overall amount of energy that's available. I will spend two of my precious 10 minutes to highlight the international story a bit more. And I do this because it's so important. And that is, we have seen in a number of places, I'm highlighting an example here from my home state of California, but it's one of many examples from Kenya, from Brazil, from Italy, from Portugal, from Nicaragua, where government standards to require higher levels of efficiency can dramatically drive us to discover ways to get more energy out of current or future boilers at the industrial level, to install more efficient lights, to use smart timers. In fact, we conclude that the fastest way in Sabah to meet the largest fraction of the new energy demand is by encouraging strongly energy efficiency. And over the past few days, I've had some very, very productive and heartening discussions with some of your elected leaders who see this very clearly and see very clearly the opportunity to support what's taking place at the industrial development at SESB, in the palm oil industry, in the small and distributed hydro, 
and make energy efficiency not only the first priority, but in fact, it is the least cost option. 